open up to Luke 15. I'm real excited about tonight's message. I don't know how many more of these. I don't even know if this one's going to be one I really get to do. <laughs> um, what I mean by that is any more, anything, you know, all I have on here is scriptures and about two sentences. And any more, these were study notes. In the early days, by golly, this was the study plan. Point one, point two, point three, you're dismissed, you know. <laughs> then over the years, I mean, in those days, it was all, str- I, I even had them pre-printed. I gave them out as handouts ahead of time, you know. Holy Ghost isn't messing with my service, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> and, you know, the Lord blessed that. I mean, that was that Bible study we did, and he blessed it uh, all that he could. <clears throat> People got saved and healed and baptized in the Holy Ghost. And, but then we started traveling on the road, and. And uh, he began teaching me because I, I didn't know any of these people. And He told me, he says, you don't know what they're facing. You have no idea what their needs are. You don't even know what they understand or don't understand, you know, knowledge of the scripture or anything. He says, but I know all of that about them. So you've heard me tell it before. He said, at this point now, you've become like a steward of the mysteries. You've got all these revelations like, a, like on the shelf in the library on the inside of you. He says, but you're going, if you'll trust me. To start, uh, you know, allow me to just tailor the service. Each one of them, I will, I will pull the volumes off the shelf and I will put them together. And if you'll let me do that, he says, I'll minister to every person in there. Not one person will leave without what they need. Well, that was wonderful and scary as all get out, you know. I mean, you did not have a clue. And then, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you were here Sunday or not, but Sunday, I didn't hear it during the service because we were ministering over here to those young people. They were getting filled with the Holy Ghost. So I, uh, I read it later when the prophecy came out. But while we were ministering over here, Dave was in the aisle over there. I wish I'd have brought the prophecy with me, but I got the gist of it. Uh, in essence, the summary of that prophecy was, our services are going to get stranger than they are now. <laughs> and... By man's definition, they may seem less structured. But by the Holy Ghost definition, they're going to be more structured. And it's exactly what that song is. Freedom because we yield to you. And so, you know, if, if you're accustomed to waiting till 7.30, because that's when the, you know, the worship ends and the service begins, uh, you, you may find uh, you've missed other things because... Who knows? Yes, and the other part of that was, in that prophecy, the Holy Ghost says he has a lot of things to say. But usually he doesn't get to say them because he gets programmed out of the church's services. Now, he wasn't talking so much about this church. He's just saying, as a rule, just like in the early days with me, my programming allowed for no interruptions by the Holy Ghost. (laughs) Well, those days are behind us, is what I'm saying. And, my, you know, he can say what he wants to say. And plus now he's got a group of people with enough of a foundation, not just here, but those that have been trained around the world, that uh, he can say some things that he might not have been able to say. Well, he, he said it, that he has not been able to say before. Not in, not in centuries, not in maybe longer than that. So I'm excited. This is a... I'll go ahead and say this too now. I, I'm not a prophet. I, I really don't know what's coming, you know. But I will tell you this. There is a lot of alarmist prophecies going out right now. And they may be right. It may be that all kinds of disasters coming on the earth. And I mean, Jesus said they would eventually. And, and uh, you know, maybe, maybe real quick, you know, with war and trouble for America. And, but we have a commandment. From our Savior himself. When you see all of these things, he said. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Now, he's, he put that responsibility on us. Now, he's not going to do it for you. He said, you, let not your heart be troubled. You have a Savior. You have a provider. You have a redeemer. I do not care what comes on the earth. My father still has the recipe for manna. He still knows how to send the ravens with bread in their beak and he knows where to find the water. 
we are commanded not to fear. Fear not, little flock. He feeds the birds of the air. Are you not much more valuable than they? So I'm not saying the prophecies are right or wrong. I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I, you know, that's not really my office. But I do know no matter what it is, I have a Savior who's going to see me through it. Me and my family. Now, it may be different. I'll tell you this, too. The days of the church, the most glorious days, and here I am prophesying, saying I'm not a prophet, but I can read. I can read the Bible, and I'm telling you, when all that kind of stuff starts to happen, what usually happens with the church? Great harvest. Depends on where your values are. You know, if, you're, if your values is people getting saved by the tens of thousands, the best days of the church are in front of us. I'm telling you right now. Hallelujah. All right. Luke 15. Uh, this is where we find the, the prodigal son, what we normally call the, the prodigal son. I'm not going to read that whole parable because you know it by heart probably. His father had two sons, and the younger one came and says, uh, give me my portion of the inheritance. And the father did that, and he left, and he squandered it, you know, in riotous living. <laughs> and sure enough, he went through, you know, none of you ever knew anybody like that, that young and going to go out and taste the world and run out of money. <laughs> oh, I'm preaching about me now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, he went out and he blew through his inheritance pretty quick, apparently. And he got so bad, he wound up feeding the hogs. Now, for a Jew, there's, it doesn't get a whole lot lower in life where you're feeding the hogs. But even worse than that, he got so hungry. Here's the fault. If you can picture this now, let's meditate for a minute. Picture the See, I've been on, I have an uncle who was a hog farmer. I know exactly what it's like. <laughs> you better be able to run. When you take the slop to feed the hogs. Because I mean they are not courteous. <laughs> they'll, they'll take your hand off at the wrist. If you get that hand in the way. Between their mouth and their food. Yeah, those things will get you. Now here they are. You got all these hogs. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're, they're eating this slop out of the trough. You know? Here's a little Jew boy. Here's a little Jew, nice Jewish boy. You know, And he is so hungry. <laughs> Here's... <laughs> He's thinking about putting his face in the trough with the hogs. It doesn't get any lower than that. I mean, you know, I always say some people got to gotta hit bottom. Some people got to hit bottom and bounce a couple of times. <laughs> and I think that's where this fellow was. He was at the bottom. And he says, it doesn't get any worse than this. So he finally come to himself. <laughs> and he says... Uh, let's, let's just pick it up there. As it is. It's verse 17, Luke 15, 17. It says, when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And, and is that true? Absolutely it's true. And I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off. I love this. His father saw him. How did the father see him when he was yet a great way off? The father was out on the front porch looking for him. Every day, he was going, maybe today's the day. Walk out there. If, if heaven has a front porch, I don't know. But I'm meditating. You know, the father saw him a long way off. How did he do that? Well, I said, he walked out on that porch, and he's looking down that dusty road. Far as he could see, maybe today's the day, my boy. Father never stopped loving that boy. Father loves the sinners. Father lo loves all the fallen sons of Adam there's nothing more on his heart than rescuing all of the sinners of the world, getting them restored back into the family. There's nothing, nothing more important, nothing on his heart more than that. So when the father saw him a long way off, he didn't even wait. It says, 
When, he's, when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and the father ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. Now the son, he had his speech all rehearsed, you know. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. And the father stopped him right there. He wasn't going to hear any more of that. But the father said to the servants, bring forth the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead. He's alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to be merry. Sitting in this room or hearing my voice, you're probably already born again. You were born a prodigal. We were. Because of the sin of Adam, we really didn't have a choice. We were born already with a sin nature. Born a prodigal. But the Father didn't love you any less. He loved you with a love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You've already experienced this part. You've already been born again. And when that day you repented of your sin and came back, back to your father, heaven had a party. The angels rejoice. He says later here, the angels rejoice more over one sinner that repents than over 99 that need no repentance. You know? But now really my message tonight, what he's having me minister to you tonight, is not so much about the prodigal. It's about the elder son. And it applies to you. It applies to all of us. There, I mean, there are no people that were not born prodigals on planet Earth. So now, once you've been born again, once you're in the kingdom, and especially if you've been around here for a while, what I mean the prayer center, if you've been under this training for a while. Well, I've got friends over here. We've, we've been in training for about 30 years now. <laughs> you know, by, the, by this point, we're the elder son. He's looking to us to work with him on this mission of seeking and saving the lost. The ultimate elder son would be Jesus. But now here's the church. See, here's, here's, the, here's the problem. This, the attitude of the elder son. So let's look at him here, picking it up in verse 25. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him, said, Come on in. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither, trans neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son, wouldn't even call him his brother. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots. Is that plain enough? Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Now Dave was ministering on this the other day. You all know this is one of my... Luke 15, 1 through Luke 17, 10 is one of my babies, you know. I mean, that's, that's one of the first passages I ever saw that was a whole image. I've taught a lot out of this section. But I saw something, hey, the Word of God, we're never going to come to the end of the Word. Have you figured that out yet? God's Word is eternal. God and His Word are one. Anyway, Dave was ministering out of here within the last month or so. This time when I heard Dave say this, he was just reading the scripture for some reason. When he said it, I saw a correlation I'd never seen before. Why is that happening more and more? It's called assimilation. Assimilation of the books. You greatly assist the Holy Ghost. If you'll get those books, just read them 30 times, 40 times, 50 times. Get them on the inside of you. Especially the New Testament. Do that first. What happens then, something in one book, first it'll be chapter to chapter, something in one chapter unlocks another chapter, but then a difficult passage in, in one book, you'll be reading another book, 
just same thing worded a little differently and it'll oh my god and they start correlating and you go you start seeing truths you never saw before but as soon as this thy son was come which hath devoured thy living with harlots thou hast killed for him the fatted calf calf uh, verse 31 is the verse when Dave read this. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. And this is it. And all that I have is thine. All, look to somebody and say, All that I have is thine. You're afraid to say that to somebody. What if they take you up on that? <laughs> but fathers do it with sons. They also do it with daughters. All that I have is thine. Why? By inheritance. All that I have is thine. Now, let's, let's don't leave this too quick. This elder son is a good son. He's been laboring in the fields. He said he's never transgressed. Now, I can't make that boast myself even after being born again. <laughs> Only the blood of Jesus makes me never to have transgressed. <laughs> okay. But the point is, according to Scripture, he's a pretty good son. He didn't go out into the world. He didn't transgress. He's laboring in the Father's fields. He's not out somewhere else. And yet the Father plainly tells him, you know, he says, well, all that I have is thine. Now, the question is, why didn't the elder son know that? Apparently, he had a, whatever, whatever level he was living at, hey, it was me two Sundays ago, my phone went off right here. <laughs> whatever level of inheritance this elder son was operating in, apparently, there was a vast, there was vastly more inheritance that truly belonged to him that he didn't know anything about. What would cause that? He's obedient. He's not into deep sin. He's laboring in his father's fields. You could say it this way, I'm being about my father's business. How could he have so much more inheritance and not, and not know it? Well, for the same reason, he didn't understand his father's heart for the sinner. No fellowship. He had relationship with the Father. I have a series. It's uh, at the website. Most of you have probably heard it by now. If you haven't, you ought to, really. It's called The Serving Son. It's based on this principle. And uh, I took a little liberty, you know. I said, well, what if this elder son had just decided at one point, you know, I... I labor out here every day in my father's fields, and, and uh, I love my dad, but, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't spent any time with my father. I can't even remember the last time we just sat down. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive by the Krispy Kreme donuts and pick up a, pick up a dozen assorted, and I'm going to stop by the Starbucks on the way to dad's house. And I'll just walk in there and say, put, put that on the table and say, Dad, why don't you and I sit down here and have a little Krispy Kreme and Starbucks and Let's just talk. What's on your heart, Dad? You know what? It wouldn't have been very long, them talking. He did. One of the things that, that son would have noticed is as they're talking, every now and then he'd notice the father's eyes kind of glancing out the window towards the, towards the road out front. And they'd be talking again after a little while. It wouldn't be very long. He'd notice that father. He's glancing out the window down that road. He says, are you, are you expecting something? Father, what are you looking for? Your brother's been gone a long time. I haven't seen him. And I love him. I don't, know, I don't know what's going on with him right now. I don't know. I just, I just want him back so bad. I just keep looking and hoping that just any time. Next time I look, I'll see him coming back home. Now, the brother, he might have, obviously, he had all kinds of wrong notions about his attitude towards his brother. He says, well, Dad, I figured you was probably mad at him. I went off and squandered your inheritance with harlots. I figured you'd 
Didn't even want to see him again. I didn't know you felt that way. And as you know, they continue to have some donuts and slurp some more coffee and keep talking. And he gets to finding out his father's heart and how his father's heart is just aching over the loss of that loved one, that, that prodigal that's gone. If he'd have kept at that, he'd have said, well, Dad, I didn't know you felt that way. Would you like for me to go look for him? <laughs> What's that called right there? That's the birth of your ministry. When you find out your part to help the Father go seek and save the lost. That's your, you found your part of the ministry right there. Now what would the Father have said? You'd, you'd be willing to do that? You'd be willing to give up whatever it is, is that you're doing and you would, you would go and look for your brother, my, my son who's lost, see if you can find him, bring him home? Well, yeah, Dad, if that's really what you want. I don't know if I could afford it. And the father right there would say, listen, if you're willing to go look for your brother, you have access. Uh, listen, son, all that I have is yours. I will load up camel trains. I will, I will fund you. I, if you get out there and run out of stuff, I want to send you. Now, here we go with the comforter here. This, I'm going to send a helper along with you. That any time you ever need anything, you communicate to that helper. He'll, he'll let me know about it, and I'll send whatever you need. <laughs> Excuse me, i got to go pray. <laughs> But see, it happens as your heart begins lining up with the Father. Now this phrase, look at it again. I want you to see this with your, in your Bible. That phrase in verse 31. He said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. Now this phrase, and all that I have is thine. You got that? The father says to the son, all that I have is thine. Go over to John 16. And the other thing I started to say earlier, these notes that I bring now, they're really just scriptures. There's one, two, two sentences on there that aren't just verses. Anymore, this is a holy suggestion. <laughs> it's somewhere to go. Unless he takes us somewhere else. And I, when I heard that prophecy, I read that prophecy that came Sunday through Pastor Dave, I said, well, Lord, nothing I say, nothing I intend to say is more important than what you want to say. So just let you know, you, you, you want to say something, you've got another one. I'll sure do it. So I'm excited about what's coming. Now, look at this. John, to me, 14, 15, 16, and 17 just four of the most incredible chapters in all the word of God starts off with the works that I do shall you do also and greater than me shall you do he begins telling them how he's going to be leaving and going to the father and they get all upset about that they don't want him to leave and he says don't worry I'm going to send you another comforter and this one you're never going to have to go through this again this one's never going to leave you he's going to be with you forever he starts going into all this teaching about the dispensation that is to come. And then in verse 12 of John 16 now, he says, and, I, and think who's listening now. This is the, these are the close ones. This is the 12. These are, there might have been more than just the 12, but at least them. These are the ones that have been hand-trained by him for three and a half years. I mean, they've sat around the campfires at night and in between the, the cities as they would travel from here to there and not only heard the, heard the services when he would preach, but then if they had questions, they got to ask questions, and he would answer them. Now, he did it mostly in parables that they could under, understand with the natural mind. But think about Peter when he heard this statement. Jesus said to Peter, all the rest of them too, but just think about Peter. You know how he was. Love Peter. Jesus says, I have, met, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you, you cannot bear them now. What would Peter, I can just see his hand going up. 
Lord, I can do it. <laughs> Tell me now. You have things to say? Yo, speak on, Lord. <laughs> Wouldn't we do the same thing? I mean, Lord, tell me now. But see, they were not born again. And he had been teaching them. He taught them in parables. He used natural examples most of the time, trying to convey spiritual truths to natural people. And he, he's brought them as far as he can. Even Peter, he says, Lord, he says, Lord, Peter, I have so many things I'd like to tell you. You can't bear them. Dave would give the analogy every time he would come to this passage. He would say it would be a lot like when uh, one of his boys who was maybe four years old, you know. I think about my little lily cakes, you know. She's four years old right now. Little legs. I don't know. About that long, maybe. And uh, my little granddaughter. She'll do anything for Papa. I mean, she's just, she really will. I ask her, she's a very obedient child. I ask her to do something. She does it and does it, enjoying doing it, you know. So if I told her, if I handed her the keys to the town car, I said, now, Lily Cakes, go out there and start the car, drive down to the grocery and get Mimi a jug of milk. Yes, sir, Papa. <laughs> I don't know if she really would. Let's pretend with me. She says all the time, Papa, can you pretend? Okay, pretend with me for just a minute. So she'll go out there. She may get in the car. You know, she'll sit there. Can't even see over the dash. Her little legs won't reach the pedals. Arm, she'd have to lean forward so far to even put the key in. I mean, it's not that she wasn't willing. But she had no capacity at all to be able to do it. Jesus had brought these men as far as he could as long as they had a death nature. To know, to go any further into spiritual things, they would have to be born again and have a spirit that is capable of receiving the knowledge of God. Just so you can see this, and I, you probably already know it, hold your place there. We're coming right back. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 real quick. Dave again has taught us eloquently out of this passage. Look at verse 11 of chapter 2. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. And notice how they got it right. They used a little s. That's correct. The spirit of the world is the one you're born with when you're born from your mother's womb. That's the spirit of the fallen nature of Adam. Now we have received, he's saying now that we've been born again. This, he led these people to Christ himself. Now, now that you're born again, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. And they got it right again, little less. That's the new nature. Once you have that nature, why, why did God, what, what was one of the reasons that you had to have it? He tells you that we might know the things that are freely given to us. Of God. If you write in your Bible, right, I write it there in the margin, it'd be a good place to write inheritance. What did you get? What, what did you receive as a son of God? What, what inheritance did you step into? The Holy Ghost has been sent to teach you those very things. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Dave used Chuck the duck trying to get that across to us. Chuck was a duck in reality, but he was raised by chickens and told he was a chicken. Tried to peck the ground with that old flat beak of his and he couldn't get any worms, you know. Every time they'd go by the pond, he'd want to go jump in it. He always thought he was just an ugly duckling. No, they kept saying he was a chicken when in truth he was a duck. So finally, I... Some ducks flew down on the pond. Chuck began learning from a duck. Duck things. Comparing duck things with duck things. And that duck would say, look at my beak. Look at yours. Or he'd say, my bill. Look at your bill. Look at those webs on your feet. Do chickens have those? No. Look at, the, look, look at your feet, boy. Now come, follow me. Flap, 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 flap. Flap, flap, flap. And they'd take off, you know. 
Well, that's what's happening here. See, verse 14. Well, the last half of 13, the Holy Ghost teaches these things, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You have to, if you've been born again as a child of the living God in your spirit, you've got to be taught by God's spirit. But until you are born again, you have no capacity to understand spiritual things. There'll be foolishness to you. That's what he says in verse 14. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You've got to receive it in your spirit first. That's why I love praying in other tongues. It's a master stroke of genius by God our Father. He bypasses that whole intellect that thinks it's so smart. <laughs> the thing really, well, I won't even say anything, but... He just bypassed that whole thing where he could just communicate Holy Spirit to reborn child of God's spirit. Say, let me teach you some spirit things. You, I got things to say to you. Now, we're back over here and go back over to John. See, Peter, I got, I got so much to tell you. But you just can't bear them now. In other words, while they had that sin nature, he couldn't take them any farther. They have no capacity to understand it till they're born again. But now notice... Verse 13. Now he's talking about after they get born again. There's going to be a teacher, all right, Peter, but it's not me. Then it's going, to, it's going to be the Holy Ghost. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come. He will guide you into all truth. He doesn't push you. He doesn't make you. He doesn't force you. He won't kick you out of bed at 3 in the morning to pray in tongues. He guides you, if you're hungry, to be guided. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. I remember the day that it came across to me what that means. The Holy Spirit hasn't come to replace the Lordship of Jesus. He's not come to replace him as your Lord. No, what he hears, that's what he's going to tell you. What he hears in the presence of Jesus, that's what he's going to tell you. He doesn't replace Jesus as your Lord. He brings you the Lordship of Jesus. That's how we hear the mind of Christ, through this agency of the Holy Ghost. And he shall glorify me. Boy, he does that. Now get this. We're coming up to the, to the parallel here. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Well, what things would that be? And when Dave said that the other day, going through the prodigal son parable where the father says to the son all that I have is thine I heard this John 16 15 here's Jesus the son saying all things that the father hath are mine you talk about the elder son he is the elder son now the question is now notice he says Therefore said, but because that's true, therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Now the question is, why would he do that? Are we just supposed to, you have that Jesus and you have that Jesus and he gave you that? Oh my goodness. And look at these more treasures that the Holy Ghost is just going to show us for all eternity. All these treasures that the Father has given you, all that the Father has is yours. That's good for you, Jesus. And, and I'm glad the Holy Ghost is showing it to me that. Y'all know the answer, right? Now, why would the Holy Ghost, why is it so important that the Holy Ghost show us everything that belongs to Jesus? There's only one answer to that. Because we have been made joint heirs with him. And all that the Father has, if you knew it. <laughs> See, we're a lot like that elder son. Gary, I'm already going to church three, four times a week. I'm already praying in tongues every hour that I can. I'm praying in the car. People think I'm crazy. Praying when I mow the lawn. Praying in line at the Walmart. <laughs> Casting out devils every chance I get, Gary. I'm working in my father's fields. Doing this and doing that. And I know it's true. Hey, you're preaching to the choir, friend. <laughs> yeah, so was that elder son. Busy out there laboring in the father's fields. But boy, he had an inheritance he didn't know anything about. Yeah. What I'm finding out is we have an inheritance we don't know very much about. 
And the answer is not how you, how you solve that problem is not going to be any different for us than it was for him. The only way he would have ever known about it is going to have to go in and spend time with his father. Until the father's heart starts becoming his heart. Now, see, right there, I should call Dave up and let him pick up right here and teach about love. <laughs> this is why the love of the Father has to become one with us. Okay. <laughs> I'll say it if I can. Uh, it's almost, I, I want to say it, I can't, I can't prophesy it. I can't hear it clear enough, but it's, it's like this. To comprehend, the word I hear is comprehend. To comprehend the inheritance. There is no avenue to do it apart from his love. Can't intellectually happen. It comes by his love becoming one with you. Or it doesn't come. You just never know about it. Doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. Doesn't mean he doesn't love you and helping you and blessing you. And you're the apple of his eye. You are. I hope, I hope that parable earlier, that shortened version of the, product of the, uh, the serving son, can you picture him sitting across the table from his father? Here he comes in all upset with the brother. And he, he just figures that the father's mad at him. And, you know, that's the way religion is anyway, you know. But sitting there as they slurp their coffee and eat their Krispy Kremes. I know there's Krispy Kreme in heaven. Don't tell me there's not. I, don't write me no letters either. Anyway, fellowship. God, I haven't had one in probably a year and a half. But anyway, can you see as they talk and he sees the father, hears the father's voice as they fellowship together around that table, the love that the father has in his heart for that prodigal, maybe ever so slowly, it begins to be transferred into the heart of that son. If he... It may not happen the first day, it might not happen the first week, but if, if he would make a practice of going in and really spending time with his father to where the father's heart began more and more becoming the heart of the son. And they'd, pretty soon they'd be one mind, one accord. There's nothing on earth more important. I'll go look for him, father. Well, if you're going to go, I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you with a helper, by the way. Don't ever think you're ever going to be in lack. Don't you ever think I'm not going to supply everything you need. God, it's good, good. But it will never happen. I'm seeing it. I taught this, I taught this series, <laughs> and I'm seeing it even more than I saw it then. It will never, ever, ever happen. Without the fellowship first. Because the love has to become you. No wonder Dave can't get away from this. And I'm so excited. That's where we are. Why will the Holy Spirit show us all the things that belong to Jesus? Well, because... We've been made joint heirs with him. The Father, go ahead and go to John 17. John 17. The, John 17. I don't know if our, if our intellect will ever really comprehend it. Talk about something that has to be spiritually received. The whole, ch the whole chapter is so good. Um, let's pick it up in verse 14.
So this is the prayer where God the Son is praying to God the Father right, right before the cross. Right before the cross. He says, Father, I have given them thy word. And the world hath hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now what he's doing here, he's speaking, he's calling those things. It's exactly what God does. He is calling those things that be not as though they were. He hasn't gone to the cross yet. He hasn't been resurrected yet. These disciples haven't been born again yet. But he is speaking it as an already accomplished fact. So he, when he says they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world, he's talking about me. born again people. He says... I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, church, even as I am not of the world. Now sanctify them through thy truth. That's going to become really important here in a minute, that, that phrase. Sanctify them, set them apart through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. I have another series. <laughs> it's called Sent from Heaven. And it's based on this, this verse right here. You have been no less sent than Jesus himself. And look at what it says. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And I'm not even going to try and preach right there. There's no time. I recommend that series to you. And for their sakes I sanctify myself. That's going to be real important here in a minute. That they also might be sanctified through the truth. Now neither pray. I'm so glad this verse is in here. Otherwise religion would tell you it was just for the twelve. Neither pray I for these alone, <clears throat> but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's us. One way or another, I don't care who preached to you, one way or another, whether it was a radio preacher in church, somebody at where you work, one way or another, somebody preached to you the words of these men. You believed. You got saved. And every promise in here is as much yours as it was Peter, James, and John. God bless. And make a 64-year-old run off. Glory to God. Feet stay. I got to preach. Stay, I said. God. Get, want to take off. <laughs> Neither pray I for these alone, but for them. J Jesus has prayed for you. At least this prayer, I know for sure. That they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now verse 22. Dave again eloquently taught us what this glory is. The glory which thou gavest me. I, I double dog dare you to preach that verse in any church I grew up in. They'll read it, but they won't preach it. <laughs> They'll read it and you pass over it. <laughs> you don't comment on that one. Look at what it says. The glory. The, the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. That they may be one even as we are one. And at verse 22 isn't bad enough. Then he goes on to verse 23. <laughs> but I mean bad enough to religion it is. I in them. Thou in me. That they may be made perfect. In one. And that the world may know. That thou hast sent me. Now here it is. And hast loved them. As thou hast loved me. I double dog dare you. Drive to Shawnee, Oklahoma. <laughs> Go to the church I grew up in. Say, I have a message to tell you today. I have been given the same glory as Jesus. 
And the Father doesn't love Jesus any more than he loves me. We'll see how quickly you go out of town on a rail. <laughs> Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we didn't have the word of God on this, I would never believe it. We would, none of us would. It's too wonderful. It's too beyond human comprehension. One of my relatives did call me within, this, within, within the last couple of days. And they love God. Don't get me wrong now. They love God. You, you better be careful. Don't get too self-righteous. I mean, these are good people. When they find out you're in trouble, they'll give you the shirt right off their back. Boy, they'll help you. And they love Jesus. And they're trying to get people saved. And praise God, you know. But one of them did call me. I'm not making it up. Just in the last few days. And in the course of the conversation, this person said, now, see, me and Dave, we both love Johnny Cash. Is Johnny Cash in heaven? He's got to be in heaven. That's all I'm saying. He's, you know, we love, we love some Johnny Cash songs, you know. Well, this relative was telling me, he says, I was just listening again to that, that Johnny Cash song. I love it so much. Well, which one was it? I'm just an old lump of coal, but I'll be a diamond someday. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just an old lump of coal, but I'll be a diamond someday. See, and that kind of thinking is all I grew up with. That's exactly it right there. And the thing of it is, it's not all wrong. I mean, that old body you're wearing, that's, if you're just going to refer to the flesh itself, now that part of you is a lump of coal, and you're going to change that in for a diamond someday, okay? But they're not really talking about that. They're talking about them. It's like all those other songs. I can't quote them exactly, and you ought to be happy about that. But, you know, the essence of it is, oh, here we're so poor and tired and poorly shod, and through the muck and the mire, and we hang on till the end, but at the end, there's God. <laughs> Boy, just so edifying, you know, just... And it puts everything off until we die. And the devil's hoping that's just the way we believe it. He said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to cast out devils. Wait a minute. <laughs> no devils in heaven to cast out. I'll have that healing anointing in heaven, bless God. There's one problem about that. Ain't nobody sick there. Yeah, but I know I'll be prosperous. Well, that's true. <laughs> but what we count valuable here, they call asphalt there. Paved the streets with gold. You heard about that one guy. You know, I know you can't take it with you, but like Lily says, can we pretend? <laughs> this one guy, he finally, he made it. He made it through, had a little bag with him. He made it into heaven and brought something with him. But the angels were astounded. They said, oh my God, what's in that bag? We've never seen, in all the millennia, we've never seen anybody come into heaven and bring anything with them. And you've got a bag. It, it must be the most precious. Can we take a peek in there? The guy says, well, I, you're angels. I don't guess you'll steal. Okay. All right. All right, I'll get a little peek now. And he opens up that bag. Of course, he's got gold in there. And he opens up that bag, and they look in it, and they go, pavement? You brought pavement? No, if we're, going to, if we're going to walk in that inheritance, the way we see the firstborn, and I'm talking about the real inheritance, the, which is everything that the Father has, if we're going to ever walk in that, we're going to walk in it like the firstborn walked in it. Everything we need, the gifts, the anointing, provision, your own health, whatever it is you need as you find your place in the body of Christ. But it doesn't come without that love. It doesn't come without the Father's heart. I could say it that way and it'd be easier. It won't come without the Father's heart. But the Father is love. He doesn't have love. God is love. See. Well, Dave taught us in verse 22. What is that glory? Real quickly now. I've got to hurry. The glory which thou gavest me I have given them. Well, what is that glory? Well, Dave, again, he's, he's given us the, the parable of the nerd boy, nerd girl, you know. Let's do the nerd boy, you know. If you could, 
if you could hack in, if you could, your fingers could fly across that computer and you could do what he did, you could hack into the FBI file. So if you got the nerd's glory, you'd be able to do all the same things. If you had Arnold Schwarzenegger's glory, you'd have his muscles and you'd, you'd talk funny, but you'd have his muscles and you'd be able to do everything Arnold Schwarzenegger could do. But Jesus said, we got his glory, same glory that he had. We've got it now. What is that glory? He gave us the glory, the standing of sonship. We're no longer that lump of coal. I can't sing those songs anymore. It's not true. It's not true. And my flesh, I could sing that about my flesh. But you are not some lump of coal. You know why it's so easy to believe that? The other preacher. And go, what other preacher? Your day, every day, <laughs> your circumstances, how you reacted to them. It's so easy to believe that we're just forgiven and not really changed. It takes no faith at all for me to believe I'm that lump of coal. All I got to do is quit looking at this, quit listening to tapes, quit, or I keep saying tape, quit listening to the messages. And just give my full attention to my, my daily life and every little mistake I make and everyone else makes. And focus on that. And pretty soon I'm just, I'm just absolutely convinced. I'll be singing that. I'll be right in the choir with them singing that same old song. I'm just, a, I'm just a lump of coal, but I'll be a diamond someday. It takes no faith at all to believe that. But the just shall live by faith. I'm telling you. Right in the face of your worst mistake, you go to the blood, you get cleansed. Okay, I said mistake. Even if it's just blatant sin, <laughs> you confess that sin, you go to 1 John 1, 9, you get, un get that under the blood, get it washed away, and you hold your head up high. Say, I, the blood has made me clean. The blood has washed it away. He's made me righteous again. I am my father's son. Where is my robe? Where is my ring? We'll put the shoes on my feet. Where's the fatted calf? All that the father has is yours. All right. Apparently he's going to let me finish this. I'll be uh, turning. Okay, the glory. The glory is that standing of sonship. I'll be turning to Hebrews chapter 2. I should have said keep your place. Okay, Hebrews 2, but and then also find John 17 again. We're going to come back there. So pinch those together. While you're turning, let me remind you this. When it, another thing about that glory. John, John 1, 14 says, The Word was made flesh. Who's that? That's Jesus. And dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Now, the way they described it then, because at the time He was the only. It says, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And that's true. At that moment, he was the only begotten. He is the first man born spiritually alive since Adam. He's the first one. He was the only begotten at that time. And notice it talks about we beheld his glory. What glory? The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. We be the glory of sonship. He is the Father's son. But look at Hebrews 2, 10 and 11. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing, what? Many sons to glory. Many sons. He's not the only begotten anymore. You know, now after the resurrection, he is called the firstborn from the dead. Not the only born. He's called the firstborn from the dead. Why? Because through that... the the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he made possible this new birth where many sons can come into that same glory. What glory? The standing of sonship. And he loves you with the same love that he loved the firstborn with. God, that is, it's going to take all your faith to believe that. How can I believe that, Gary? Because the word of God says it. It's got nothing to do with what you did today. It's got nothing to do with how you feel. It's got nothing to do with your performance. He loves you just as much as he loves Jesus. You go, no, it can't be. Yes, it is. It is the truth. Not no lump of coal. 
I am my father's son. I'm just beginning to find out about my inheritance. You ain't seen nothing. Hmm. So it, but notice, it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect. Oh, okay, we, we, can, we need to stop reading right here. We can't go any further than this. Through sufferings? Now, I know I'm going back to the first church now. <laughs> now. I told you a while ago, now pay attention at sanctify. He's going to sanctify himself. And then he talks about sanctifying us. I said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Then he said, for their sakes I sanctify myself. Look at this. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. One what? One nature. One spirit. One family. We are all the sons of the living God. Now go back to John 17. I'm going to show it to you again. We're going to get into the sufferings. What in the world is he talking about in a practical way? I was watching on the news today and they were showing that bombing over in the Shiite. The Sunnis did a bombing, bombing of the Shiites and they were showing that festival that they were doing. And here's a, it must have been 200 men in that arena there. And they're all flogging themselves with chains and whips and stuff, just flogging themselves, you know, just, you know, like that's going to do anything. Trying to keep the flesh under with human effort. Anyway, getting back to this, that's what religion will do to you. And worse. So let's, let's look at this again. John 17, going 16, starting in verse 16 this time. I want to go through it more quickly. I'm sorry, 17, let me just pick it up here. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. Up here he said, he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified. So he sanctifies himself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. It's talking about us. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And look at verse 22. The glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me. And has loved them as thou hast loved me. But notice, he brought that firstborn to perfection through what? Through sufferings. There is a verse that none of us like to hear. Religion will never believe it. It says, Jesus was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. We don't, we don't really think that that's true. We think, well, he may have been exposed to it, but he wasn't really tempted by it. See, in his spirit, yes, sir, come on. How did you say that earlier? If he had more, uh, see, there's that word. <laughs> if, if Jesus, now Jesus is God. Adam was not. But it says Jesus laid aside his divinity, his divinity. If he overcame the flesh or the devil with power that we don't have, then he is not the captain of our salvation. He is not the pattern for us to look at. Let's look at it another way. If he overcame temptation with anything more than what Adam had, then he's not the captain of our salvation. He's not the pattern for us to follow. But see, the truth of the matter is he started off with something less than what Adam had. Because Adam's body was not corrupt. Jesus, his spirit was conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Ghost from God the Father. But his body came from Mary. 
He is the pattern. A man with the spirit of the living God on the inside, clothed in fallen flesh, and then anointed by the Holy Ghost. But before he was anointed by the Holy Ghost, for, was it 30 years? 30 years, he was tempted in every point like any other human. And that means tempted. It doesn't mean exposed to. It means tempted. His flesh was no less saved than your flesh. His flesh wanted four dozen Krispy Kremes just like mine does. And I could go a lot worse. We don't like to think that about Jesus. His flesh was no different. Tempted in all points like we are. And without the power of the Holy Ghost, he never sinned. Why? Because he had the nature on the inside which is of God. Now that is our first level of inheritance right there. And the church has taught Against that, a church at large, you're just an old sinner saved by grace. You know, thank God it'll cover it all and so forth. No, we're not just old sinners saved by grace. I'm not that lump of coal. I'm already a diamond on the inside. I have power over sin. I don't care what happened today. <laughs> I don't care if I did lose my temper and made hand gestures at people who cut me off in traffic, which I didn't, but I, I have. What I'm saying is it doesn't matter. I'm just trying to relate. What's that got to do with the Word of God? What's that got to do with the finished work of Jesus? I'm His Son. I've been born again. And as I mature into that inheritance, I can put the, my foot on the neck of sin. And it never, ever be able to get me. That is the truth. That is the truth right there. Then as you get the Holy Ghost, he also comes to help us against our infirmities. Yeah, he'll help. That new nature helps. And boy, he helps too. Plus, he's your teacher. Because there's a whole lot more inheritance than, that, than just that. I mean, like that wouldn't be enough. Going to heaven and not hell and I don't have to sin anymore. I mean, that's a lot. <laughs> but we haven't even started talking about your ministry yet. Because he wants, he wants to sit across from the table and have the Starbucks and... Donuts with you, fellowship with you, if you'll allow me. Until his heart starts getting into, into your heart, and then you go, Well, God, well, is there a part you, Father, is there something you'd like for me to do in this? To, well, I thought you'd never ask. Yes, I, there's a place for you. Here's what I've called you to do. Here's your part in it. Boy, you said about to do that. Now, that's where your provision is, that's where your anointing is. I did it. That's where your joy is. That's where life gets exciting and scary. <laughs> it's a life of adventure. Mm. I am going to quit sometime. You just don't know when, do you? <laughs> All right. What is this suffering? See, well, previews, we're just going to touch on it a little bit. Go to Romans 8. Y'all ever been to Romans 8 in your life at this church? And also, put a marker in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm actually heading for a closing here. I'm so excited about this. Listen, the, the title of this message is going, is going to be, All That the Father Has is Ours. It is. That's the truth. All that the Father has is ours. It's been ours the whole time. You can't even know what it is, much less appropriate it, until His heart meaning his love, starts coming into you. Only as that happens do you start getting an inkling of, gee, you want me to help? What would you like for me to do? And the answer to that question is your ministry. Now you're on the path. His, his heart's becoming one with your heart. And then the mind of Christ starts coming. Just like he instructed the 12, he begins instructing you. Your part in the ministry. And it doesn't mean everybody's full-time. I'm not saying that at all. There's gospel entrepreneur ministries. There's, there's every kind of ministry. Hmm. Romans 8. Now what about this suffering thing, Gary? It says he was, he was made, the captain of our salvation was made perfect, mature through sufferings. What is that? Do we, we don't have to do that, do we? <laughs> Romans 8, 17 and 18. And if children, if we're, if we're children, then heirs. You want to stop right there? No, okay, I like the next one. 
heirs of God. I like that. I like that. I'm not only an heir, I'm an heir of God. I'm God's. Turn turn to somebody and say, I'm God's heir. I have an inheritance. And then, as as if that wasn't good enough, then look, and not only that, you're not a sub heir. It says, you are a joint heir with Christ, period, and there's nothing else after it. Oh, there is. (laughs) And join heirs with Christ if. What? What? If. So be that we suffer with him. That we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, first level of that, not what it's talking about here, is real easy. Persecution and affliction for his namesake. There is that kind of suffering. And the the way, the direction our nation is going right now, there's going to be more and more of that as you stand up for the truth of the gospel. But that, in Romans 8, that's not really what he's talking about. The sufferings he's talking about is the sufferings of you, the heir of God, spiritually alive creature, Clothed in mortal flesh that is so fallen, it wants to commit every kind of heinous sin. And when you don't let it, it makes you suffer. <laughs> it makes you suffer. What they're trying to get, what what the writer here is trying to get across is Jesus had to keep his body under. His body was no less fallen than yours. Yeah, no less fallen than yours. He was tempted in every point, just like we are. It was, let me say it another way. His flesh didn't like not sinning any more than your flesh doesn't like sinning. Not sinning. <laughs> hmm. Now, Dave has already taught all of this. Let's do it this way. Let's keep going just so you know for sure. Okay. Okay, verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For, they, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which had the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, were waiting for something. What is it? The redemption of our body. See, what, what is the subject matter here? He's talking about keeping that body under. Even when everything in it wants to sin. Everything in it even wants to make you think you're a lump of coal and you ought to go sin with it. And there's a suffering with corralling that thing. And he says, but I'm telling you, even a lifetime of keeping your body under, even a lifetime of groaning against and standing against sin where you will not let it sin. He says that whole lifetime of that isn't even worthy to be compared with the very first instant that you receive that new body and received up into heaven. Let's back up just a little bit. I still, I know we're running over a little bit. Too bad. <laughs> well, it's important. It's important. Okay. Um, look at verse 9. Okay, we're just going to teach the whole born again trail again tonight. No, we're not. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. How many of you are born again? You got the spirit of God dwelling in you. You're, you're in this. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So you've got that nature on the inside of you, the spirit which is of him. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. 
If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Now, that's the subject matter he's talking about here. If you live after the flesh, you'll die. But if you through the spirit, and really that should be a little s. It's not through the Holy... He, doesn't even, he hadn't even brought in the Holy Ghost to this equation. He's been talking about your new nature. If you, through the new nature, just like Jesus did before he was baptized in the Holy Ghost, if you, through the new nature, do mortify, kill, stop, put to death the deeds of the body, is that plain enough? <laughs> you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, and again, that's a little s. It's talking about your new nature. Your flesh goes... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sin. And the new nature goes, no, we're not. Now, who are you going to yield to? As you learn to yield to that new nature, the spirit of God, little s, that spirit he put on the inside of you, that's when you're walking as a mature son of God. That's the first level right there. For you've not received the spirit of bondage again. See, they got it right there, little s is correct. You've not received the spirit of bondage of Adam again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, little s should be, whereby we cry, Daddy, Abba, Father. Hmm. What is your inheritance? Well, for, oh, 2 Corinthians 4. What is your inheritance? First level. Hardly anybody in the church even knows this. You, you can't walk in it if you don't know it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. First level of that inheritance, you have been freed from sin. First level. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. We really don't have to. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to. <laughs> I, pro I will exhort you not to like Jesus. Don't go and sin no more. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, a lawyer. There's a lawyer in heaven that's on your side. And guess what? Your Father is the judge. This is good. Anyway. <laughs> but we really don't. We can mature through suffering. What kind of suffering? In the context he's talking about. The, the groanings of that flesh as you do not let it. You do not let it do what it wants to do. You reel that thing in by the new nature first level of my inheritance body you are you are done ordering me around i am in charge the new man is in charge here you're going to do what i say and your body i'm telling you right now your body you're going to fight you on that there's going to be some suffering coming i'm telling you right now but you can win you can win and a lifetime of it it's not even worthy to be compared to that first moment in glory all right, 2 Corinthians 4, we'll close on this. The title again. Now, really what Paul's talking about here is not so much overcoming the flesh. This is the other part. See, in this world, we are going to have tribulation. Jesus said persecutions and afflictions. Well, Paul's giving quite a list here of things that they've, you know, cast down but not forsaken, Perplexed but not destroyed. I'm not getting it exact. But all of those things that were happening to him too. That kind of problems too. But he says, you know why we're going through all of that? Why we're willing to go through it all? Everything we're doing is because all things are for your sakes. Thank God for Paul and the twelve. The men that pioneered this gospel when all hell was against them would not compromise, could not be bought, could not be tempted with sex or anything else, held true to the gospel, and we have their words. All things are before your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Look at somebody and say, all that the Father has is mine. I intend to find out more about it. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would take of his and show it unto me. I'm going to spend more time with the Holy Ghost. And more time in fellowship with my Father. Till his heart beats in my heart. 
Hallelujah. Did you get anything out of that? Glory to God, people. I do not want to, I do not want to get to heaven and go like the elder son. Well, you know, you never, you never gave me a kid. We probably wouldn't say that. We'd say, you know, we'd get there and he'd say, well, didn't I tell you to win China? <laughs> I'm just picking on. Didn't I tell you to win China? Yeah, but you never gave me any money. I wanted to go do it, but you never gave me any money to go win China. You know what's coming? You know what the next sentence is going to be? All that I have was yours. Reminds me of a verse, you have not because you ask not. I've got to quit. Father, we thank you for your word. <laughs> Father, thank you for this little bit better understanding of the inheritance and mostly, Father, how it comes. I see that it is so impossible to intellectually receive this. It cannot be received apart from your love. Cannot be. So, Father, for that, I'm as, I'm as thankful for the, as for the knowledge of the inheritance itself. Father, help us truly sit across that table in fellowship with you. Help us really fellowship with you so that your heart becomes our heart. Your love flows through us so that that inheritance can flow to the world. We 